I'd like to welcome everybody to the last and fifth class of the George Just Ecology course. And it's been uh, exciting for me to, to give this uh, course and uh, to do all the classes. Uh, I suppose we might pick up a few people before the end of the, the evening. But this was the day, according to the syllabus, where students present their papers, class discusses what they learned, what was missing, discussion of the relevance of Henry George and today's political environment. You know, one thing that you might want to do after this is over, um, YouTube, if you look under the words vulnerable people, vulnerable states, there'll come up a video of Daniel Bromley giving this talk in 2012 when his book came out. But you don't really know that he's talking to a group of uh, young people coming from the United Nations. Like apparently they represented various countries, I think primarily Africa, maybe some Asia. But you don't know that they're in the audience until at the end when they're asking questions. So it's kind of interesting to see what people pick up and such. Uh, essentially the video is uh, an indictment of the 50 years of uh, billions of dollars spent on eradicating poverty. Essentially, Bromley is saying that it was misspent because it was, uh, it was focused too much on the people who were given the money. Like, show me I'm doing some good, rather than you know, maybe the hard things of building the infrastructure and building the foundation so that they can kind of take care of themselves. And uh, that's that critique. You know, as you go through your class notes and watch the videos again, you'll notice that there were three main thrusts that I introduced uh, in the, I guess, in the forefront with progress and poverty being on the backside. Is that the, that was a theme that tied everything together is Henry George's uh, progress and poverty. Uh, it's a, a timeless work that goes back to 1879. You just have to think and put yourself in that period. Um, that was like three years after uh, Custer got uh, massacred. Not too, uh, I mean, so it was Wild West still around in the United States. He wrote and, the book before then, though. That was just yeah, that's when it was published. Yeah, so it was 71, I think, he started doing all this. So it really wasn't that far after. Um, Lincoln got shot. But so, um, so that was how the, the course was set up. So you might recall that the first major thrust after the first uh, class when I was trying to just introduce the whole thing, I had you read uh, Eric Reinert and it was about the German economic tradition that uh, posed the, uh, the two systems of economic study side by side that have always been there, but if you study economics in college or if you, if you go to this meeting with Janet Yeltsin and who's ben, Bern, Bernanke is going to be there and Gregory Menke is going to be there, that these two traditions have been there you know, since the beginning of uh, uh, economic thought and philosophy. Uh, what the German economic tradition was focused on was how to bring Europe out of this crisis after the 30 years war that ended in 1648. And these German um, economists, well I guess they weren't called economists at the time, but there were people who were trying to address the how do we uh, administer the public affairs. Sometimes they worked with princes, sometimes they worked with kings. Sometimes it was independent, but it, uh, it was a, a matter of survival. So what you try to do is get your, your own house in order so that once you got that up and strong, you can start uh, maybe trading and working with other nations because uh, you don't want to put yourself in a, in a compromised position with uh, somebody who might become your enemy. Kind of like uh, right before World War II, we were, we were shipping all of our scrap metal to Japan and before too long we knew that they were building airplanes that are going to come bomb us. So 
maybe we should have had an inkling of something going on. But, you know, it's one of these things of, you know, could this be going on? I mean, it's, it's a matter of, of public policy. Yeah. If you're running a country, you should always be thinking about, well, what if? And, uh, you know, what am I not thinking about? And, you know, the smart companies and the smart governments, they, they do that kind of thing. Like, everything's hunky-dory. There must be something going on that we're not looking at. So uh, let's go study this. And maybe they'll find out everything is hunky-dory, and then they can re uh, relax. But So the German economic tradition, I guess what I'm trying to say in summarizing what Eric uh, Reinert had to say, he said that there, besides the barter and trade philosophy that came out of um, Adam Smith, which was uh, a colonialist type approach to economics, there was this German tradition that uh, included other nations in, in Europe, all the way from like Sweden down to Italy, and uh, I think there was one in Spain, but uh, they looked at what worked, and people traveled, and they kind of spread ideas. In fact, there was a lot. Of, there was something in that Reinhardt article that talked about how uh, King uh, Henry the Seventh, before the Eighth, so Henry the Eighth's father would be in in Europe, and he would look at the traditions that were being done there, and he kind of brought some of those those uh, traditions back for that other, you know, what Reinhardt called the other canon, C-A-N-O-N, uh, another way of looking at things. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to talk about how Andy Grove of Intel is essentially voicing that same point of view uh, concerning what we should be doing as a nation regarding Silicon Valley and technology. So the, the second um, thrust was the, was the Daniel Bromley fisheries economist deception the deceit that uh, he was talking about. And that was um, the, uh, the idea that uh, uh, commercial fishermen are fond of promoting themselves and saying that they're sustainable and they're doing good for society and they're giving something back. And then you scratch the surface on all this stuff and it's just one big lie. It's, it's not like they're bringing in bad food. You know, that, that'd be crazy because they're in a business to sell food. So they're bringing, uh, you know, seafood to shore. What, what was the deceit that Daniel Bromley was trying to get at was something that was dear to his heart because he's a, a professional economist and he saw where economists were using um, well, he was being, um, he was being, um, let's say, I guess, well, he was using words like uh, incoherent. So rather than scumbags, he would <laughs> use words like these people are doing things that are incoherent. It doesn't make sense against the economic tradition. Um, the, um, so you might recall the, the graph that had the, the, um, the dollars on the left hand on the y-axis and on the, on the x-axis it had the fishing effort and if you look at the, at the, uh, the amount of effort that uh, might start impacting on the sustainability of the fishery uh, that might be a, a, a point where you might want to recapture or maybe capture the resource rent that's out there in the fish. And uh, then Bromley brought up the point that isn't it strange that oil companies have to pay for oil if they're going to get it from the Gulf Coast, for example, or the, the, the lumber companies have to pay for the timber before they harvest it. But uh, the fisheries, uh, uh, commercial fisher people, um, essentially get the fish for free with these uh, individual trading quotas. So he's... Uh, He's making a proposal for how to, to right that wrong. And essentially, he's using the um, economics argu arguments uh, related to um, rent, economic rent, resource rent. 
He touches on Ricardian rent, but in the fisheries, Ricardian rent really doesn't have much uh, applicability because of fish moving around like this. So, but uh, it's a very good article for people involved in Henry George because you get hit with all these rent concepts that, um, and you know, somebody might tonight get up and talk about all those types of, of rent. Now the, the third one, uh, the third major idea was the, the Rowan Van Eaton approach to ecological management, ecosystem management, and then the other paper from Kelly. And I preferred the, the Rowan Van Eaton uh, paper because it was more thorough. It kind of uh, included all the types of ecosystem thresholds uh, types of uh, ecosystems, and the Kelly paper was very specific about one type of ecosystem, and that was ones that are lightly dominated by humans. So it'd be more of the self-sustaining ecosystem or maybe the adaptive management. And the Kelly paper was trying to get at the idea, if you go into a micro view of this, that you can find out that there's going to be situations where the ecology has a, a threshold or a tipping point and you manage these things just so that they don't tip. And I, I suppose there's some applicability, but it's, to me it was um, managing a large scale ecosystem, which is Rowan Van Eaton. And I saw the Kelly paper being more like, what's a good thesis for a master's uh, uh, degree? Uh, has some applicability and might be interesting. It might be useful in the Rowan Van Eaton approach, but for that group that might be studying uh, uh, self-sustaining management or adaptive management. So it's not like uh, it wasn't useless. In fact, there was a lot of good stuff in that uh, Kelly article. Uh, you, you probably did need to read the paper by Ostrom, which goes uh, beyond those eight points I was talking about, because what she had done, which informed the people who wrote the Kelly article, she identified various factors. I think there are some like 30 or more. And so she explained how you could arrive at a, a Garrett Hardin approach to ecosystem management, which we described a little bit about the the, the false choice of if you got resources that aren't being managed correctly, you should privatize them or let the state run them. And we all know that Ostrom got her um, Nobel Prize in economics based on the idea that, that people and organizations, they self-organize. And that, that was the deceit that Garrett Hardin got into. Because if you don't include that, then it's like, well, the world is kind of hopeless. You know, we got to might have to invest in these billion dollar corporations because they're our only hope. Well, no, that's not, uh, that's not true. People can self-organize and take over a big chunk of how society could be managed. You just have to have a lot of people doing it and uh, will to do it. So those are the, the three major approaches. And I thought that was a, a good way of merging uh, Georgist economics with ecological approach. Because as far as I know, nobody's really attempted to merge Georgist economics with ecology. And I, I, um, I guess I'm eager to get some feedback on whether I was successful in, in pulling that all together. So uh, I guess this is the end of the course. Thanks a lot. Thank you.